Hey, welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm Matt Dillahoney. This is Don Baker. It's Sunday, October 20th, 2013. This is a live public access television program. You're listening to the dulcet tones. No, hey, how's everybody doing? Uh, sometimes I just have fun for my own benefit. So yeah, this is a live public access television program. The, tel the telephone numbers for you to call in and interact will be posted on the screen shortly. How have you been? Good. It's, it's been, been a long time since you and I have been on together. Yeah, that's because you're wrong about the logical episode. <laughs> <laughs> we had a pre-show call where, where we actually came up with this discussion. No, it's actually just coincidence in the fact that, uh, you know, you're only on every five weeks or so, and then I take some that, weeks off. Yeah, and, yeah. So it's good to be here with you again, finally. Yeah, yeah, I'm thrilled to be here. And, and I hear that you actually have a topic in the failure series, kind of? Yeah. Yeah. Is it a failure? It's kind of a failure. It's kind of a success in a way. Is it an epic fail maybe? This time? <laughs> no, it's not an epic fail. I oh, wouldn't say we, might, we might disagree there, but today <laughs> you're going to talk about heaven. I'm going to talk about heaven today. Cool. Well, take it away. Take it away. Okay, well, I've, I've done 18 shows previously on the topics of Christian failures, and uh, i got I got lots more to, co to go, uh, but today I'm going to talk about heaven. And, uh, and what's, what about heaven, and, and why is that a failure? Well, heaven, briefly, is a reward for a good life. And, you know, that's kind of how it's usually couched. Uh, a promise of ultimate justice for your good works. From an atheist perspective, heaven is the carrot in the carrot and the stick of religion, right? Uh, the, the, the stick is hell and the, the heaven is carrot, and, and it's, a, it's a way of getting those asses to go where they want. So, <laughs> so I have to jump in right from the get-go. <laughs> yeah. So... I, I, I'll agree with you that there is this idea out there that heaven uh, is occasionally tied to good life and good works. However, um, there are a number of Christian uh, denominations, including probably the majority ones, which would vehemently disagree and say that your passage to heaven is in no way tied to your works okay. or living a good life in any way, shape, or form. And that's, uh, I think, one of the main points of the show today is, is there is a lot of vagueness, a lot of disagreement about what, what is this thing? How do you get there? What, what's all this? And uh, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, we, we, in, in the Star Trek series, we know what color Spock's blood is, but we don't know what color his earwax is because it's off the script. The script writers never put it in there. And this heaven thing is kind of like that in the sense that there's, there's bits and pieces about it here and there, and they don't add up very well, and there's a lot of speculation and, and rifts and, and spin and these sorts of things going on in these different religious branches. And, uh, you know, f functionally, it's, it's a little like winning the lottery, right, or this idea of winning the lottery. It's a pleasant fantasy that is not likely to happen, um, and the reality of the situation won't be nearly as good as, as what you think it will be. It's, it's kind of like that. You, it's a dream that they're, they're selling you, I think. Ultimately. I don't know. I'm pretty sure that winning the lottery would be just as good as I think it would be. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not positive. Well, you're going to stand up with this giant, giant check for some amount that you'll never see. That's the first thing that's going to happen, right? I'll see because enough of it. Because the tax man is going to take a bunch of it. Yes, I've already <laughs> calculated that. And then all the scam loss. artists will come out of the woodwork to get, to get their share and the relatives that you that never heard of. And <laughs> I'm rich now. You can all go to hell. So I, I, I think that, uh, you know, this, this heaven thing, if you really think this through, is, is a failure in the sense that even basic questions about it, are, you get muddled and confused answers uh, like, where is it? How do you get there? Who will be there? Who will you be when you are there? What will you do there? And can you leave? I mean, these are sort of the, the, the fifth grader or five-year-old's five questions about heaven. 
and uh, and they don't have very obvious, straightforward answers. They got, there are a lot of muddle here. So where is it? Well. Part of the Bible has this firmament model where there's this earth and underneath it is hell and above it is heaven. And of course, that's not, not really how it is. Uh, we're on a sphere that's floating around, uh, this, going around the sun, orbiting the sun, and the sun is orbiting around in this galaxy and all this stuff that, that is, just knocks the socks off the Bible. And, uh, you know, the Catholic Church was just terrified when telescopes came out because they figured out that, oh, these Galileo and these guys are going to look up in the heavens and, or look up in the skies and figure out there isn't heaven up there, the heavens. So you can know, even use that term. If you're Mormon, uh, there's three heavens depending on, you know, where, how good you were in this life and maybe you'll get your own planet. But uh, the modern interpretation seems to be that uh, it's a place outside of space and time, and it's spiritual only, and, and it isn't really a physical place. And, and from an atheist perspective, it's not distinguishable from anything real. It's imaginary, as, as far as we can tell. And uh, you'll be there with your imaginary friends. Well, how will you get there? Well, there's a lot of confusion about that, too. Um, uh, among the Catholics, uh, the Catholics say it's going to be your good works that will get you there. Among the, the Protestants, well, it's more of your belief that's going to get you there. And, and even in the Bible, there's a lot of confusion. There's uh, maybe a hundred and so quotes about how you're going to get to heaven or something about heaven, and, and they all kind of contradict each other. In, so, in, addition, in addition to the beliefs versus works controversy, there's also the idea that, um, that neither is particularly relevant. Mm. And that it is uh, a God's, gift of God. grace, ah, um, right? God's, and then there's God's the Calvinists ultimate. who, you know, God's determined who's going to get there, and there's nothing you can do either way. Oh yeah. It's a, well, that's that's a good point. Yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot of confusion. Um, yeah, and, and and these sorts of things of uh, of uh, you won't even know necessarily, or or uh, the number of people that are going to be there is is, is confused. So uh, back to the belief versus works, uh, you know, uh, because if you confess with your, ha your, your, with your mouth and Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This is according to Romans 10, 9. But in Matthew 19, 16 through 17, and behold, a man come up, came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he, this is Jesus, said to him, what? Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only who is good. If you should enter life, keep the commandments. So it's talking about the, the, the commandments of the Lord. So there's, there's, uh, there's confusion even there. What about sin? Well, is, is sin going to be a bar to heaven? Well, uh, uh, according to Romans uh, 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but, but a free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. But Martin Luther said... Be a sinner and let your sins be strong. Sin boldly. Let your, let your trust in Jesus be stronger and rejoice in Christ who is the victor over sin, death, and the world. So sin's a good thing for... Anyway, so a lot of confusion about how to get there. They, they move the cheese around, keep you, keep you guessing. Who will be there? Well, God, God and Jesus will be there and lots of characters from the Bible. There's this whole problem of uh, did, is Adam saved because Adam hadn't, hadn't had a chance to confesses sins or whatever to, to Jesus and, and, and the whole Jesus thing came later. So what about those earlier biblical characters? Are those, are those guys there? Well, we're not quite so sure. Uh, there's, there's certainly this pleasant fantasy that you're going to see all your lost relatives, your grandma and other loved ones that, that have died ahead of you. Um, you know, Martin Luther, uh, who is a pretty, pretty awful person, is supposedly going to be there. He, he certainly believed uh, he was. Uh, Torquemada, Pope Innocent, who, uh, who uh, orchestrated the, the witch burnings. Uh, Mother Teresa, who's, who's pretty awful, she's going to be there. Maybe Hitler's there because he, uh, you know, he, he was a devout Catholic. We don't know. So uh, who else is going to be there? Lots of embryos, maybe. Uh, you know, there's a lot of vast majority of uh, pregnancies don't come to term. You know, the embryos doesn't, doesn't, come out, doesn't uh, implant. Uh, maybe dead infant, infants uh, who died in, uh, you know, early on. You know, we have a low infant mortality rate in the last hundred years, but that wasn't always the case. Uh, maybe there'll be a lot of fat people there since people die of heart disease a lot. I don't know. Uh, maybe the, the senile folks. You, you get a new here. body, supposedly. You get a new body. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's you good. You get a new, wonderful, perfect body, which raises the question of will anybody be able to recognize you? 
<laughs> okay. Right, you'll be groping around in the dark. You'll be able to recognize me. Uh, first of all, I won't be there, but I'm already perfect, so there won't be that much change <laughs> if I do end up there. Gosh, I'm lucky to be here. Okay, well, who won't be there? Well, well, you know, a lot of folks think the Jews are not going to be there because uh, heaven, heaven is a Christian invention, and maybe the Jews don't even think they're going to be there. Because anyway, Gandhi, uh, who uh, a lot of folks think was a pretty good guy, is not going to be there. A lot of non-believers aren't going to be there because we're not. We're not following Jesus. Well, so that's, that's a little bit of confusion. And, and, and this gets to the question of who will you be when you be there? How, will you be, how you, will you be the same and how will you be different? Well, I think one of the more interesting things is you're not going to be able to feel empathy because heaven is the ultimate end and fulfillment of the deepest human longings, the state of supreme definitive happiness, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You're going to be blissfully happy there and if you, if you feel empathy and you feel someone's pain, perhaps those folks down in hell, then, then you can't possibly be in heaven, right? Mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't be happy and human and have empathy at the same time. So empathy requires feeling someone else's pain. And that's actually, that actually ties to an argument I made that there's nobody in heaven. Mm -hmm. um, because of what we know about individuals and what makes me me, my memories, my preferences, uh, my entire personality. Um, and so the, the point I've made before is that my mom, who is a Christian and is convinced that she's going to heaven, um, if she's correct, she'll end up in heaven and I'll end up in hell. And yet that would make my mom sad. And since there's no sadness in heaven, um, then whatever th that entity is that's in heaven, it's not my mom. Um, it, it, it couldn't be, and so my mom isn't in heaven, and, and anybody who is actually, because we're human, um, you basically, the best you could hope for is that there is some facsimile of you there, uh, but it wouldn't actually be you, because being you requires you to be able to empathize with people and to feel things, including pain and sadness and, and other things like that. It's, yeah. And so on that note, um, Nobody who's ever lived is actually in heaven, <laughs> and nobody who's ever lived is going to be in heaven. Right under that right. model. Under that so. model, right? So that's that's a that's an interesting point. But but presumably, uh, when you're up in heaven, you'll have knowledge of folks that are down in hell, right? You'll have potentially ultimate knowledge. And there's a there's a Bible quote relevant to that. For for by these he has granted us his precious and magnificent promises in order that. By them, they might become partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 1 4. Um, so there, there is some, some biblical idea that, that you're going you're gonna to know about the people down in hell. Uh, the alternative is you're not going to know, and you've been kind of lobotomized, and, and in which case this feeds yep. right back into it. You, you're not you. <laughs> you're not you anymore. We've, we've excised <laughs> your memories and your preferences right. and your personality. The other thing is that there, are, there were a number of sects that had... Um, this idea that one of the joys of being in heaven would be to look down upon the people who are suffering yeah, in hell and I take have a pleasure in justice being you know, served. Yeah. In fact, uh, we can go to that quote. The happiness of the elect in heaven will in part consist of watching the torments of the damned in hell. And among these might be their own children, parents, husbands, wives, and friends on earth. One part of the business of the blessed is to celebrate the doct doctrine of reprobation while the degree, decree of reprobation is eternally executing on the vessels of wrath, the smoke of their torment will be eternally ascending in, in view of the vessels of mercy, who, instead of in taking part in their miserable objects, will sing, Amen, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. It's worth noting, <laughs> it's worth noting though, that that, that, uh, that quote and the idea behind it are... Uh, somebody's opinion of what the Bible has to say, which, by the way, is true for almost everything you're going well, to hear. That's what theology is. It's an opinion it was about one of the things, gods, right? God. It was one of the things that struck me odd. For, I, I did, for five weeks, although I missed two weeks, we did this exploregod.com uh, initiative where we met with people from churches and talked about these issues. Um, I did a couple of videos on my personal YouTube channel. I still got some more that I'd like to put up eventually. Uh, but the whole initiative kind of struck me as odd because basically you've got a bunch of people sitting around giving their opinions about God and discussing them um, rather than a God giving you the actual answer. Right. <laughs> hey, what is it that you think God thinks of? I mean, it would be like, you know, I claim to have a personal relationship with Don. 
<laughs> but instead of Don coming and telling us what he thinks about this, if all the rest of us who are here in the studio got together over at my place and sat around and said, you know, what do you think that Don thinks about this? Yeah. Well, I think that Don probably <laughs> thinks that. Really? Because it's always impressed me that Don might actually <laughs> right. think. I mean, it's nonsense. And all this profound stuff. And, 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 and Tell as, us if, what you as think. if there's no way to actually have this conversation with God or, or you know, if yeah. God exists and you could talk to him, you wouldn't have this sort of thing. I mean, if we did that about Don, it'd be called gossip. And uh, <laughs> since Don actually exists, we could actually get Don to chime in on it. And so this idea that people are sitting around gossiping and giving their expert opinions, which disagree on what a God thinks, is, it seems to me an admission that they are unwilling or unable to get the answers from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Not so, that you're a horse. <laughs> okay, good point, Matt. So, what were you gonna? What are you gonna do when you get to heaven? Well, there's this. There's, Leave. If you're, if you're, uh, if you read the comics or whatever, you'll see people flying around with wings and playing harps, and, mm. and that that seems kind of kind of dull. Um, maybe you'll be praising God the whole time, and that that also seems rather rather dull. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I, I can't listen to hymns the way I used to when I was a believer. I will, you know, acknowledge that there's some that are musically, you know, uh, well done and, and enjoyable. Uh, but even if I could suffer through a rendition of How Great There Art right now, uh, I don't think I could sing How Great Thou Art over and over and over and yeah, over and yeah. over and over and over. So and that's, over. that seems to be one of the problems with heaven is it's just the, the eternal boredom. You're going to get tired of whatever it is there. Maybe you'll be talking philosophy with embryos, you know, or maybe they'll be smelling their, their smoke cones. They're being tormented in hell because they were born human or not born human. We're not quite sure. Um, uh, there's a thought that there might be sex in heaven. Uh, C.S. Lewis has this wonderful quote uh, you can find on our uh, atheist, atheist uh, ACA website about uh, trans sex. Wait, we're going to have sex with trans individuals? <laughs> no. no uh, this is trans as in better, better than the, the sex here. I thought, oh, we, as, all right. <laughs> it's, 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 it's super We're wonderful. now beyond sex. Yeah, so he made the, the analogy of if you're trying to explain what, what sex is here to a kid, you might say, oh, well, it's like eating chocolate, but it's, but it's even better. And so by analogy, sex in heaven is going to be so much better that we can't even imagine it. It's like trying to, you know, that's, that's the analogy. And, and a quick <laughs> side note, um, while I know that the Texas education system is horrible at explaining uh, sex and stuff, uh, if you as a parent are having difficulties doing that, there's a number of really good resources so that you don't have to resort to just simply saying it's kind of like eating chocolate because <laughs> that could cause a whole bunch of problems. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're, you know, Muslim, uh, you get, and, you, and you're a martyr, you get 72 virgins. But if you're a female Muslim, you get grapes in heaven. Isn't that great? Isn't that wonderful? And, and, and <laughs> you, you get grapes. And you get to be part of a harem if you didn't right. actually have sex right. before. Right. Yeah. right. So ironically, uh, on this sex thing, uh, they, they, they promise you in heaven the kind of the things that you don't get to have, or they, they would deny you here in in, uh, in this earth, right? It's gay sex. Gay sex. That is, that is trans sex. <laughs> this is, it's trans go. sex. It's <laughs> the things that the church denies you, right. which is evidently better than chocolate. Okay. So, and we talked about enjoying the torments of the wicked. Uh, so how could, imagine doing any, anything at all for all eternity, and how, how would you be happy doing that, doing the same thing over and over and over again? You know, you know <laughs> if you saw somebody um, who was happy, I mean, uh, joyful, at witnessing the torment of others, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I, I don't know what the clinical term is. Is it sociopath, psychopath, sadist, sadist. whatever, sadist? <laughs> um, these are not good people. Right. Right. That's kind of the hidden point here. Is uh, hey, if uh, if this is what excites you about heaven, uh, we got a problem here. <laughs> okay. Can you leave heaven? Well, if Satan could, Satan uh, would, you know, was part of some sort of rebellion where he left. Uh, uh, he got kicked out. Kicked is, out. Is maybe different from kicked, leaving. Okay. So we don't know. We don't it's, know. It's, actually, this, this story about getting kicked out is kind of sketchy and, yeah. and de yeah. developed more from non-canonical things. This is more, more storybook stuff. Uh, according to some, you're even incapable of sin in heaven. Uh, which I, I find amusing because uh, this is an admission that, uh, that God can actually create a place where you supposedly have free will and you're not able to sin, 
And why didn't he just do that the first time? Well, it's in, it's in <laughs> contradiction with this idea that, um, you know, for example, the, the angels rebelled. Mm -hmm. which would be sin, it'd be a crime against God, it'd yeah. be a sin. So obviously uh, it, it's possible, but it may be that it's only possible for angels, that we've been created as lesser beings so that we can be little, uh, ooh, you're so great God automatons when we get there, um, right. because it went so horribly wrong with the angels when he gave them free will. <laughs> so we get our free will down here, um, kind of. Uh, we won't get into a free will discussion. Go ahead. Right, right. Anyway, so, you know, uh, heaven seems to me like a, a bit of a place where you have a lobotomy, you're, n you're not quite yourself, uh, and you're being locked up there, and you're, you're stuck there, and, and it's really boring, and, and you, you, I don't know. Even, even the pleasures there sound pretty awful if you repeat them jillions and jillions of times. I mean, if you even took the people who liked boring things and said, we're going to take you to this place where there's just every this day. constant <laughs> tedium. Uh, <laughs> I, I have a hard time thinking, you know, I mean, maybe a hundred years of that, a thousand years of that, you know, but a million years? If, I mean, oh, I know. We're just scratching the surface here. We're talking eternity, right? Crazy. Huh? A million years is, is nothing. So, so the, I guess the gist here is, is, is even basic questions about heaven is, is just a muddle of confusion. There's a lot of contradictory messages in the Bible, a lot of theology, uh, theology opinion floating around that's just not justified. And it's because we're off the script, you know, we don't know what color Spock's earwax is. Uh, different people, different sects believe different in incompatible things, and there seems to be no higher authority around who, who they can ask for help and sort it out. So if Christians would just spend a few minutes thinking about it, they'd realize this doesn't make a bit of sense, and there's no evidence for heaven, hell, or most of these religious constructs, and it just seems to be a, a pleasant, pleasant fantasy for the gullible and a way of controlling them, and uh, it's a success or failure, depending on how you want to look at it, of Christianity. Yeah, it's actually this whether or not it's success, a success or a failure is something that I've, I've kind of talked about before because people will, will say things about how religions, Christianity in particular, provide people with this benefit, even if it doesn't happen to be true, of dealing with grief, of the loss of others, that, oh, you will meet them again in the great beyond, and uh, all these other things. And I would say that I see that as a failure, because whether or not it's true matters. If you've convinced people that they are going to see their loved ones again in another life and it's not true, then you've actually done harm to them. And by perpetuating this, it affects how people are likely to treat people in this life. And, you know, if you were instead under the realization that as far as we can tell when we're dead, it's over, that might have an impact on how people not only treat other people, but how they begin to deal with grief and how they begin to look at death as being an unavoidable eventuality of life, uh, setting aside the transhumanists who think we may be able to beat death at some point, I don't know. But until that comes to pass, we're stuck with the practical reality, which is one of these days I'm going to die. What does that tell me about what I need to do in the interim? Right. Where should I spend my time? What should I focus on? And one of the things is that this idea of Pascal's wager that, oh, if, if I believe and I'm wrong, I've lost nothing. Well, no, you haven't because you've lost every second that you've spent believing and praying and every penny that you've donated to help spread the lie over and over again. You've lost quite a bit. And one of the most important things you've lost is access to the truth because anytime you accept a proposition, without sufficient evidence to justify it, that stops you from looking for another explanation, the one that may actually be true. So you've lost your opportunity to learn something about reality that may affect you in really big ways. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks, Don. We're sure. going to go ahead and get calls. calls. As a reminder, after the show's over, uh, there are some people here who get together and go to dinner at uh, Threadgill's 301 West Riverside Drive. Um, can't tell you to go, but, you know, do what you want. Anyway, uh, Stephen in Morganton, Georgia, how are you? Good. Here's Matt. Yeah, we traded some emails. Yeah, yeah we, we uh, talked through email. I, I think maybe I can hear you a little bit. Okay. When I, when I said it, oh, sorry, am I echoing? I'm, I'm having a little trouble. A, a little bit. If, if you're watching the stream, turn the stream off um, or mute it or whatever else, but go ahead and... And, and kind of make your point, and we'll... we'll... Hello? 
If the echo's, um, if the echo's bad, we sure. can just take your call offline or take your question offline. Is that better? I guess so. What, it's what good, was your... it's good for us. Go ahead and go. Okay. When I said like Christians, okay, you guys know who Bill Maher is, right? Yes. Okay. Bill Maher made a thing about hypocrisy of Christians, like, you know. Religious. Yeah. But mm -hmm. He said, like, a true Christian not go around parading all happy when Osama bin Laden was killed. Well, I don't know whether that's true or not. I don't know why it's relevant. Oh, like, just, uh. It's not up like, to Bill Maher. It, Bill Maher doesn't define what a true Christian is. I'm not sure who defines what a true Christian is or if anybody does. Uh, because well, that's, that's every different, every denomination, thing, every, every individual from all the different denominations is going to have a different definition of what a true Christian is. Right. Well, I, I was raised Catholic, but now I consider myself non-denominational, you know. Uh, I guess we can just, this is a very d difficult thing. Maybe we should just go into my second thing really quick. Sure. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I just graduated from a high, public high school that ha happens to have a CLC Christian Learning Center. But, and I just wanted to know, like, say you had kids and they wanted to take that class, would you be okay with that? Well, I don't know enough about the class. Okay. Okay, for, first of all, it, it doesn't receive any government funding. It's off school property, and the kids have to choose to sign up for it. They can't be forced into the class. Well, then it, what's this have to do with school, then? If oh, I just wanted to know, would you be okay with your well, No, I mean, you, you said you went to a public school that had this. Now, how does the public school have this? Well, it's a not state-supported thing, but you still can get school credit. I don't know how it works necessarily. But yeah, I I'm, I'm opposed to the idea of giving school credit for that. I know that they've set up a, this is not government or funded, and it's separate, and you can sign up for it as an elective. Um, I'm pretty much opposed to wasting uh, time and education and giving credit for religious endeavors. Yeah, but he, you know, that, that's our sort of position on uh, church-state separation, but he's asking a bit of a different question. Yeah, of, yeah, I just... W would, your, w would you send kids there? Would you send your kids there? And I, I guess the answer is the same, no. <laughs> well, I, I, I wouldn't send them there as part of uh, their school uh, curriculum, even as an elective. Um, if I had kids and, I, and they wanted to go, um, I don't know that I'm necessarily opposed to that. It depends on... You know, it depends on how old they are and what the curriculum mm -hmm. is, what they're teaching. I don't know enough to, to give you an answer. Well, I mean, like, there are a lot of non-Christians who have taken just to learn about the Bible from, I guess, from a more objective point of view. Really? So this is, this is a, an elective that's not paid for by the government, and you think it's a more objective look at the Bible? No, I mean, I'm just saying anyone can take in anyone. Like, we do pray, so obviously they do take yeah, in so, you. Okay, so oh, okay, we're not we know talking what this about is. an objective thing. <laughs> this, is, this is basically a religions course that's managed to, to, to find an end around to become a part of public school systems. Now, I'm fine with comparative religions courses. I am fine with the Bible and other religious texts being uh, taught from a non-denominational, a secular perspective. Um, let me teach those courses. That's right. I would, let an atheist teach I would it. absolutely uh, enjoy teaching it and encourage kids to take it. I mean, I took a comparative yeah. religions course as well. I also was a fundamentalist Christian for oh, 25 I know plus that. years. I actually just watched your video about that. So, I mean, it's, it's not... Oop. So, I don't know exactly what you're asking. Um, I got yeah. a little tone in here. I don't know what Th it is. Th this seems like a very typical ruse to get to get uh, some sort of government endorsement or appearance of endorsement of Christianity and, and some sort there? of backdoor mechanism yeah, to get, I'm here. To get, uh, to get uh, their kids indoctrinated. That's what this looks like to me. You know, it doesn't, Wait, doesn't I, seem I'll, the least bit objective. Can I mention something else real quick? Sure. sure. Okay, actually, okay, the classes are an hour and 30 minutes at school, but they, uh, what they do is they pray and they read one chapter out of the Bible and have a pop quiz on it, and then the rest of the class they play cards. That, that's really all they do. And then we go out to eat like one, maybe once a month in there too. And, and you're getting credit school. in school <laughs> for this? Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we only had about 14 kids in the class, and the teacher had some big band, and we'd all go. We'd like, we went to Chick-fil-A one week. We went for Mexican food one week. <laughs> So, so of all places, send yeah. me an email with the details on this, and I'll be happy to contact the Freedom from Religion Foundation and see if they're aware of this and whether or not this is in fact legal. 
Mm, well, but I'm opposed to it, even if it's even if they've managed to find a way to squeak through the system. They did give us like a some kind of handbook about the law, like it, that it's perfectly legal as long as the students sign up for it at their own will and it doesn't receive any funding from the government. Okay, so let me let me ask you this: Do you yes. think it should be going on? Well, as, as a as a Christian, I believe everybody has the right to learn if they want to and if you don't want to then you don't have to right are, but do you are there churches you in getting, your town do you think you should be getting public school credit and doing this as part of your schooling um you know that's a very that's a very tough question well, I don't, I'm, I'm i'll make i'll face, make it but. i'll make it much much easier for you yeah, if we okay. can if we can do this class for an hour and a half and we start adding classes for other religious points of view that are also an hour and a half and the students can sign up for them as electives, how many electives should we allow students to go get credit for when they're not actually studying the basics that we should be teaching in public education? Well, there'd be so many then. Yeah. So I'll ask again, do you think this should be going on for public school credit? What's wrong with just going to church and uh, on your own time? I mean, isn't Sunday school and Sunday worship and Sunday evening worship and Wednesday evening worship and the various yeah. other activities, Tuesday GAs and, and, yeah. and uh, uh, actines and all that stuff, isn't that good enough? Mm. How much, well, how I, much I, time I does your point. God really need to soak up when you could be, I don't know, learning uh, history, math, science? <laughs> well, the people who usually take it are people who have like room in their schedule, like they've already taken most of their core classes and they don't really... And they, and they have no ambition? Like team sports. I'm sorry, what? And they have no ambition, so I've got plenty of room in my schedule. I really don't feel like learning anything useful or productive, so I'll go ahead and do this church thing and pretend like I've done something. Well, I'll tell you this. People at my school, I'll be honest, they were lazy. We had the principal. He had a 100% graduation rate. Yeah, that didn't happen. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so my answer is that I'm generally opposed to it and uh, – did prob most almost certainly would not uh, in allow or encourage my kids to do that. Although, if it turned out the curriculum was uh, a good study and kids wanted to, I, I don't know. I don't know enough. But thanks for calling, okay. Steve. Oh, and just one more thing before you go. When I said debate, I actually didn't mean we each get on a podium and argue. I meant come, we go to Dairy Queen, have a blizzard, and have a discussion. Now it's my idea. Oh, okay. So uh, I have no idea what my travel plans are over the holidays, but if I end up in your area and I feel like I want to go to Dairy Queen and talk about religion, I'll drop you an email. All right. Thanks, Matt and Don. Now, this was a good discussion. Thanks. Thanks. Take care. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Yeah, did you, he had mentioned uh, doing a debate if I was traveling oh, in uh -huh. his area. And I, I was see. like, oh, well, how do we do that? Uh, Joseph in L.A., how are you? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I had actually two questions. One for the gentleman that started his uh, talk about heaven, and of course for you, Matt. Okay, I'm Don. Uh, Go ahead. The gentleman that was talking about heaven, I first I'd like to ask him if he is a open-minded skeptic. I try to be. Okay, um, I have. There is something called DMT. It's basically backed by science, uh, but basically it's a, it's considered a spirit molecule. And what it does is uh, it allows okay. people Joseph? to act. Hey, Joseph, yes. I, I'm going I'm to stop you because we get literally tons of questions about DMT. Um, and you say it's backed by science and considered a spirit molecule. Uh, just to avoid confusion, science doesn't consider it a spirit molecule. It's the people who are having these experiences like to call it a spirit molecule. Um, and the, the, what science backs is that, yes, this is in fact a drug that will affect your brain. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that, that's it. So, th th Okay, let me, let me ask you a question. Um, let's say this is a hallucination. Let's just give that um, your benefit of the doubt. How can the individual who is having the experience dis distinguish this from reality if the experience is indistinguishable? They can't. If, if by definition it's indistinguishable, then they can't. And that would, that would be true for any sort of hallucination that is indistinguishable. I mean, you've defined it that way. And that, and that raises a bigger point, is, is that we make mistakes, or we have brain farts, we have uh, epileptic seizures, we have all sorts of stuff where it, it interferes with our perception of reality, and, and we can't trust it 100%. 
Yeah, there's no good reason to think that an experience had by a damaged brain is going to be more accurate than one that's by an undamaged brain. And that goes for modifications with chemicals as well. So while the people that are taking DMT are having, you know, interesting experiences and, and things that they like to label as spiritual, um, that doesn't mean that it's pointing to anything that's true. The way to demonstrate that what they're experiencing is true is to investigate it scientifically so that you get consistent reproducible results that are falsifiable, not esoteric, subjective, personal experiences. This is true whether you're talking about DMT or LSD or the out-of-body experiences and, and uh, 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 near-death experiences that we talked about last week, all of those things. And have, have you ever decided to try it yourself? No. What difference does that make? Well, so far, all of the experiences that people label as true are in and of themselves from the observer. So in order for it to be true, you would have to no, try it yourself. No, we, uh, we have independent verification of all sorts of things, like the fact that Don and I are both listening to you speak. Don can help me verify that you're not an auditory hallucination, and so can the people who are sitting in the audience. Um, now, it's true that on some level, I'm getting all that information from them through my senses, uh, but the reason that we trust that is a matter, as I pointed out before the show, actually, practical necessity, and it shifts the burden of proof to a demonstration that this is not actually reality. Okay. And I had one last question. Okay. Um, what would you accept as a form of miracle healing? I don't know. Like, if, you, if I were to ask you, what do you consider something that would be miracle healing? Well, I, I don't know. What do you mean by miracle healing? I mean, yeah. because to me... My, my definition of miracles might, might be a little different than everybody else. I, a miracle seems to be uh, some sort of uh, story about some of the unverifiable event that's used for marketing purposes. That's, that seems to be miracles. And, and yeah, that miracles exist in the sense that, yeah, there are these stories and there are these unverifiable stories of used for marketing. But, are, you know, are we talking about some sort of uh, awesome thing that we have never experienced before? Yeah, or? Actually, there is, um, sure. if you go, the only place I can direct you to is to YouTube because that's basically where all the videos are, but um, there's actually a guy in Nigeria that is healing people in the name of Jesus, as I would consider it miracle healing because he's doing things okay, that... Okay, Joshua, you believe, you believe it because you've seen the videos of this guy doing it? Correct. I'm actually going out there myself. Then I don't <laughs> think you're being sufficiently skeptical. You have accepted on exceedingly poor evidence. Uh, well, no, no, no. I'll, I'll go ahead. Okay, I will be skeptical, but that's why I'm going out there myself. Okay, and what is it? What expertise do you have, and what do you hope to achieve by going out there? At best, at best, you would perhaps see someone with an illness that's been verified by a doctor and see them healed and verify that they are no longer with that, uh, afflicted with that illness. And at that point, you now have an unexplained healing. You do not have confirmation that somebody exercised supernatural powers or what those powers were or anything else. Okay. At most, you would be left with, wow, that's, I have no explanation for that. And that doesn't justify leaping to supernatural explanations or asserting that it was, you know, because there is a Jesus or a God who did this. Uh, you, you haven't made that tie just merely by witnessing it. So you're, you're going to make this trip out there to watch some guy um, that there's YouTube videos of, and what is it that you think you're going to come back with? Yeah, I've, I've well, been to Las Vegas, and I watched, uh, you know, I watched the guys with the tigers, and uh, they did some amazing, wonderful things there, you know, the Siegfried and Roy, and... Uh, there's nobody claimed any supernatural stuff, I mean, but if, gosh, I couldn't explain it. If you don't have any, any expertise in the relevant area, and you are not able to actually go there and set up a proper experiment with good protocols, what is it you hope to achieve? What would you consider proper protocols? Well, I don't know. I don't know the specifics of what's actually been going on, but do you know? Do there you, there do are you, pro do you professional know skeptics up? that do you know do how this. to test this? No, I don't. I just take it on a faith basis that this is what there happened. There you go. That's right. the problem. Okay. <laughs> and we have a winner uh, because if you're, I mean, will, if I you're, mean, you if you're willing to, to take it on faith, why waste the time to go out there? 
you would have to accept your part as well that you're dismissing regardless. No, 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 regardless, because, no, 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 because I'm not saying this is false and I'm not saying this is not from God. I'm saying I do not believe it because it hasn't been sufficiently demonstrated. The fact that it may be impossible to sufficiently demonstrate is not my problem or my fault and it doesn't invalidate my position. Your position, though, is one of you're willing to accept it on faith. And that is not skepticism in any sense. Okay, let me ask you a question. How important is it to you that something be uh, validated as true or false. It, it, from your from your perspective, extraordinary is, claims require extraordinary evidence. Is is the rule of thumb? How important is it to me? It's my, my pretty much my mantra that I want to believe as many true things and as few false things. Which means I need a method for determining whether or not things are true or false. Are and you willing faith, to do that? Faith like, is not that method. You've demonstrated that you have. No, the, I don't see how you you could even oh, go ahead. Okay, I'm asking you, if these miracle healings are true, how important is it to you that you would actually go out there and, and with There are billions of cases of miracle claims and, and events that are mysterious or whatever, and you go, you, you don't, there's not enough time in the world to go hunt them all down. So you have to decide whether it's important, and, and most of these things... If it was actually true, and it had been confirmed by reasonable scientific processes, I wouldn't need to go out and investigate it because I'd be reading about it in scientific journals and seeing people get a Nobel Prize for it. So I don't have to go hunt down everybody who claims, the people in India who claim to be living off prana and, e and eating nothing but light and, and taking in no food. I don't have to go investigate their claims because they are, by definition, not believable until there's sufficient evidence for them. And I don't actually have to go out and do the testing myself. Yeah, it's not my job. On every single claim that's out there. There are some things, by the way, which we do not need to waste any time testing on them until somebody has demonstrated that there's a reasonable mechanism by which we might be able to explain this. Uh -huh. That's the point at when investigation is worthwhile. And so all the people who claim that they talk to the dead, well, some of them make testable claims, or that the dead talk to them, I guess, because anybody <laughs> can talk to the dead. Some of them make testable claims, and some of them don't. Now, the untestable claims are a complete and utter waste of time, and it's one of the reasons why all those psychics, quote unquote, on TV, uh, refuse to be nailed down and tested, uh, because they're giving these vague pronouncements from the spirit world. It's like they're playing charades with ghosts. It only happen when their chakras are aligned. Yeah, yeah. And, if, and, and, <laughs> and if they can actually produce testable claims, then we can test them. And you know what? There are people that actually do this. And so far, no supernatural claim has managed to withstand scientific testing to confirm that there's actually a phenomenon there. And there's even a prize for that, the James Randi Educational Foundation. And that's a million the dollar first prize. step yeah. before you get to determining what the explanation for that demonstrated phenomenon is. We can't even demonstrate the actual phenomenon sufficiently to test it. You have no hope of getting to an explanation for something that hasn't been demonstrated. Okay. Well, let me ask you this. If you had AIDS and a miracle man said he could hear you, would you go out there and do it or would you just no. say no? No. 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 No, why would I? Okay, why, let's, say, let's say I have AIDS and a miracle man says he can cure me. Um, meanwhile, we have scientific medication that is designed to treat it. Why would I waste my time going out to somebody when there's no... If somebody had a cure for AIDS, somebody has a cure for AIDS, a miracle person can, can, can cure AIDS. Do you not think this would be like the biggest frickin' news in history and it wouldn't need me to go out and verify it just because I'm the one that happens to be stricken? Right. What, well, you're talk do, what, you're talking about, what you're talking about is desperation. Oh my gosh, I have nothing to lose because I'm going to die anyway, so let me let this miracle person wave their hands around me. If I'm dying, I've got better things to do with my time than to waste it on unfounded claims. And isn't it despicable that somebody would take advantage of somebody in that state? Isn't yeah. it horrible? If you've got the cure 
cure for AIDS and you're sitting around just taking advantage of people who want to accept things on faith, then you're a horrible person anyway. That may be true. Um, <laughs> well, I do believe uh, we live in a society that uh, suppresses evidence. I think we have a lot of things that aren't out in the public. We live, this may be one we problem. live, this guy we was live in Time magazine and does have medical records from the Joseph, people that not Joseph, get cured. Joseph, yeah. we live in the time where you have the most access to the most information in the entire history of the planet. It is more difficult now to hide things than it has ever been before. And what you're engaging in, even though you haven't actually said this, when, you're, when you go down this route of, I believe that you know, there's information that's out there being, you are engaged in conspiracy theorist thinking. And what that does is it takes disparate pieces of truth and weaves together a story that seems compelling as long as you don't actually investigate or care about the truth. And I have no interest in it at all. Okay. Thanks. Bradley and Davidson, how are you? Doing good, sir. I hope you are. Hey, Matt. Hey, Don. Hey, hey. everybody. Hey, Atheist Experience. Yay. Welcome. What's, what do you got for us? Um, well, I mean, the topic was heaven, and I was wanting to put my two cents into that. But I also had other things because I've seen YouTube video of you talking about uh, being an absolutist uh, morality atheist. And as a theistic relativist uh, moralist, I find that funny. And uh, also I wanted to try a proof of God out on you. Wow, that's a lot. We've only got like 12 minutes left, so let's get to it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, let's start out with something first that I really want to get out there. Uh, okay. The um, proof that atheists don't have to fear the Trinitarian Christian God. The, the proof <laughs> that atheists don't have the fear of the Trinitarian Christian God. You don't have to fear them. You don't have to fear going to hell, in other words. Well, I well, don't. We, we didn't begin with. We, we, don't, we don't have that fear. But, okay, All right, go ahead, I guess. Okay, under Trinitarianism, Jesus equals the whole God, not just uh, the Son. Since God's indivisible, he, he equals uh, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost yeah. in one. This, sure, yeah, a lot so of funny math. variables on under Trinitarianism, if it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, yes. you could replace that with God is the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto God but by God. So mere faith in God would harken back to Abraham, where if he said he believed in God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Therefore, the same faith of Abraham, which is the faith of a mustard seed, would mean that you're saved. Okay, so, so let, me, let me throw my Christian hat back on for a second. The verse says, no man cometh through the Father except by me. It doesn't say what the actual mechanism is, whether it's belief or... In that quote. One, in that particular quote, it doesn't say that the mechanism is belief. And it doesn't spe specify what you had to believe, even if belief was the mechanism. Um, it's Not only that, it's in, the, it's in Bradley, 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 I wasn't finished. I wasn't, Bradley, I wasn't finished. Sorry. When it says, no man cometh to the Father except by me, that could be interpreted and has been interpreted by a number of Christians as being that Jesus, or God, is the mechanism, this idea of, for example, grace, salvation by grace through faith, and that doesn't mean that merely people who believe are going to heaven. So you've kind of, you've kind of skipped a portion in your initial proof to begin with. Basically the portion that defines every denomination except for yours. I don't have a denomination, but I see what you're saying. Okay. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was the proof of God. Yeah. And, uh, the, the word God is uh, extremely loaded between all the various faiths. Yeah. It has a lot of different uh, variables in, into it. And I'd like to change that word and use the word of a greater source, meaning a greater knowledge source. Because I think you could actually perhaps... So, so are we talking like space, space aliens that might know more than us? I don't, Not, I, well, I, I don't want to say space aliens. That's, that's ridiculous. I, I'm talking, you know... I don't think it's that ridiculous. Something, uh, yeah, it's the same. It's the same question that the SETI people ask: Are we alone in the universe? Well, it's a more scientific yeah. approach to it. So, first of all, you want to redefine God as greater knowledge source. Uh, you know, why not just redefine God as super person, or and or coffee cup? 
I mean, it would be really easy to prove God if we redefined God as coffee cup. Or if God is synonymous with our ignorance, right? Yeah. The things we don't know about. <laughs> or, or if you make God, let's redefine it's God there. to be the equivalent of the universe. Well, then it'd be well, trivial. You're not redefining a term. You're changing to a, a more meaningful term. Well, Something I would say... Something that we can have meaning with. I would, we can't, I would can't say prove that, a God's existence unless you are a God by definition. Well, I would... So, oh, oh I, see, I don't do think that that's true. I don't think that that's true. A lot of folks have tried. You don't, you, you don't, I don't know why you would need to be a God to prove a God's existence, but I, don't, I also don't agree that you're, uh, that you're defining God in a... In a uh, I forget the term that you I used. Think, but I think he's rejecting the God term because it's too loaded, and he's, he's yeah, substituting a, okay. something else that we're going to talk about, a different subject. A more demonstrable uh, phenomenon is okay. what I'm trying yeah. to say. So, so there might so be, there might be a, smart people out there, so, so we agree with that. Uh, I, well, first of all, I, I don't know that greater knowledge source is sufficiently defined. Um, what do you mean by greater knowledge and, source? And because is, I, is it that he, impressive? Right? Mark is sitting here, and when he's it comes to physics, yeah. he's definitely a greater knowledge source than I am. <laughs> QED, so, so, we're done. So what is, it, what is it that you're actually defining? And when, once you've got it defined and you try to prove it, what have we actually accomplished? If you define a God that doesn't have anything to do with most theological ideas of God, why have we spent any time on it? Uh, just so that we know we're not alone in the universe. Well, it's a, it's a good question, a valid question, and, and yes, there is the SETI thing looking out for that, and a lot of folks that have thought about it. I'm already uh, I don't fine. have an issue with it. Yeah, and I'm already fine with the idea that there is might be. Uh, in lots the 14-plus, or 13.7 billion years of the universe, um, the vast amount of space, uh, the Drake equation alone is enough to convince me exactly. that, it's, that it's likely that there is other life and perhaps even other intelligent life, but I don't know how you could ever make the claim that they're greater because it's entirely, it's not impossible that we are in fact the greatest intelligence or greatest knowledge source that currently exists in the universe. And the dolphins are laughing at us. Well, my too. argument goes like this. Uh, if you start out with Taoism and it talks about the way and the life and uh, there's a a parable that talks about how if you draw, drop a uh, rock into a pond, it makes the yin and the yang, the up and the down of the wave. And then you come all the way around the world uh, into the Middle East philosophies of Isaiah, which there's probably two Isaiahs, so Isaiah, Isaiah 1, Isaiah 2. Um, you have, no man has seen God's face, my ways are not your ways. And uh, then you come into the teachings of Yeshua, which says that the least of these... Uh, teaching a relative moral system to put so, your mind so, into the least of these. So this is going to be rude, but... Things it, seem to tie together into a, a philosophy that tries to teach nonviolence, these, this and is it going tries to, be, to teach uh, getting along. This is going to be rude, but I'm going to interrupt you. You start with the Tao, you go to Isaiah, you go to Jesus. Nobody gives a rat's ass. This is not the way you prove things by saying somebody said this, somebody said this, somebody said this, these things here, these disparate ideas, I'm going to connect into uh, one philosophical idea, which gets you no closer to proving anything other than that people said things. Right. Okay. Next. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost as bad as the people who want to try and, and, and prove their traditional God by appealing to the Bible. Um, I mean, basically, you appeal to the Bible twice and, and, the, and the Tao once, but uh, <laughs> it gets us nowhere. That's not the way we prove things. So what else you got? Mm. Okay, what about relative philosophy? Relative, uh, you said that, uh, I heard you one time say that A equals A, and you use that as a priori. Yes. You agree with that? Yes. Why? So we actually had this discussion before the show. Um, really? About, yes, about the logical absolutes. There was somebody who was calling in about them, and one of the things I said was I was not going to spend much time on the show today on it. So oh, I, I directed them to my private YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com slash sans deity, S-A-N-S dot D-E-I-T-Y, there is a series of videos there called the Foundational Series. One of them actually covers the logical absolutes. But can you, are you actually watching the stream right now? Uh, not at this very moment. No. Okay, so you're not going to be able to see my clever little diagram. But um, 
the basics from which you will get from watching that, that short video is that the logical absolutes are, they define or they describe a single Venn diagram, a circle and everything outside of a circle. And it is just necessarily true, obviously, clearly, unavoidably, inalterably true, that whatever's in the circle is in the circle, and whatever's not in the circle is not in the circle. That is part of the definition of the circle. And that is the same thing for the logical absolutes in that a thing is whatever it is. It's a tautology that it is, in fact, whatever it is, which means that it is necessarily true. But I'd recommend you go watch that quickie video on my YouTube channel and then maybe call back another time because we only got like two minutes left and there's still some people waiting. Okay, uh, should I just say that if you draw an A on a piece of paper, turn the paper sideways, your A literally becomes the edge of the paper. And if you were to take that A while you're looking at it directly no, on... No, it doesn't. And to speed it up no, it to doesn't. Uh, a portion no, it doesn't. of the speed of light, no, it doesn't. then that A stretches and morphs into something other than A. No, it doesn't. It still is whatever it is. The logical absolutes don't say that if you write something on a piece of paper, it is what it is from every possible vantage at all times. That's not what the logical absolutes say. What they say is, whatever that thing is, that's what it is. You are confusing. You're saying that your, your A is relative to a moment, and for that moment, it, it is an A. No, I'm saying that an A is an A. The fact that you might view it in a different way and describe it in a different way and see it in a different way has nothing to do with the logical absolutes. And at any given instant, whatever you see that as, that's what it is, and it's not what it isn't. But go watch the video. Thanks for calling. So yep, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> One more call. Yep. Uh, Tony, how are you? Yeah, how are you doing? Uh, what's it called? I was uh, calling here because, you know, I, I, had a, I made a decision with my life about nine months ago. Yep. I wanted to uh, change a little bit because uh, I was, like, really religious, like, really religious with my uh, faith. Mm -hmm. I was a Muslim. And uh, recently, I, you know, I, I have just started telling my family, and they've been coming, like, really hard on me. Like, insane stuff they've been telling me, like, really, really insane. I don't know how to deal with that, you know what I'm saying? I just want to see someone with a little bit more experience who could help me out with that. I mean, I, I, so, I've talked to people. So, with, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, they're getting ready to put the credits up, so let me ask a couple questions real quick. Yeah, uh, that's fine. Are you self-sufficient, living on your own, or are you dependent upon them? Yeah. Yeah, I am. I'm, I'm 18, but I should be gone like in about a month or two. Yeah, they're actually rolling the credits. I apologize. Email us at tvatheist-community.org. There's a bunch of different organizations, including Recovering from Religion, um, which would be happy to talk to you about dealing with some of this stuff. One of the things is that your life is going to change. It may be out of your control, and, and probably the best thing you can do is interact with others who have been in similar situations to perhaps try and help out. That's all the time we have this week. My apologies. Thanks to everybody for showing up. And the crew, whose names either just appeared. Oh, they did just appear. They're done there, but... Bye. Out of time.